Well, if you would like to, um, certainly turn in your Bibles to Matthew's Gospel, uh, chapter 11. We're going to be looking at quite a few scriptures uh, in the course of this message, and uh, for that reason they will be appearing uh, on the screen to help us all to see them and to feel the weight of the testimony of Scripture in this matter. We want to see how richly Jesus deserves this name, the friend of sinners. And uh, even though it was a name that I think was given in utter contempt for him, it was supposed to be ridicule. Here's the king of the Jews. Here's the one who many are looking to as the Messiah, and look at him. He's a friend of sinners. Who ever heard of such a thing? Well, here's where he gets the name. Matthew's Gospel, chapter, chapter 11, and we're going to read verses 16 through 19. Here is Jesus talking. But to what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces who call out to the other children and say, We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not mourn. For John came, neither eating nor drinking, and they say, he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking. And they say, Behold, a gluttonous man and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. Now, stretch your memories back to the month of January. Uh, this year seems to have gone so fast that it doesn't seem that long ago. Um, but in the first message of this year, we looked at Jesus as the man of sorrows. Um, that glorious title that he's given in Isaiah's prophecy in chapter 53. Remember that we saw that contrary to the way this generation would like to paint Jesus, he was in fact no fun lover. He was very different. There was no one indeed who suffered the same grief and torment and agony that he did. And uh, it's important thinking about that, that we have the right Jesus. We hear that from the pulpit here very often. Um, if you have a fun-loving Jesus this morning, then whoever else he may be, he's not the Jesus in the pages of Scripture. So it's very important, if we would be saved, to make sure that we come to the right Jesus for salvation. And it's very instructive to look upon the names that Jesus is given in Scripture. And there are very, very many of them. I think because for such a wonderful person, uh, one name could never be enough. You know how it is, how the names in Scripture very often tell you something about the character of the individual. And they shine a little bit of a light, a window into into the heart of the person. Well, if you're going to shine a light onto the character of Jesus, do you really think you could do it with one name? Jesus. Jehovah is salvation. Is that enough? Man of sorrows. Will that do it? Take those two together? No. Not for a savior like him. And so you will find that he has many, many names. And God willing, as we have the opportunity, I thought it would be good to take a look at them uh, so that we can see this Jesus uh, who is our Savior and we can understand his character a little better. 
And that will help us also since uh, sanctification as believers uh, should result in us being more like him. Um, it will be easier to become more like him if we know more of what he is like. So this morning, let's spend our time looking at Jesus, the friend of sinners. I've already said, and we've read it together in that passage, this wasn't intended to be a crown um, that he would wear uh, with great joy, although we have sung a hymn already that says this was a name given him on earth, and now that he's in heaven, he rejoices in the name still. It's like the name Christian, first given to the believers at Antioch. That was supposed to be a term of contempt. Little Christs. Uh, but I don't know a believer who is ashamed to be called a little bit like Christ, a Christian. Or the Methodists. That was a term given to people who were serious about knowing Jesus, and they put order and discipline into their lives so that they may not waste a moment, but they may pursue God and pursue holiness. And those who had no interest in such things saw their methods for getting to be more like God and to become more holy, and they weren't all good. There were a lot of works tied up in it at that stage, but they coined this phrase for the Methodists. It wasn't supposed to be anything good, but they took it and they embraced it. I think Jesus has embraced this name as well because it is so true. But you'll see, or you will have seen in the passage, that he was also charged with being a drunkard and a glutton. Now we know from Scripture that that wasn't true. He certainly drank wine and he certainly ate food. Uh, but there is no evidence at all that he was ever doing either of those things to excess. So what we need to ask ourselves this morning is, was this charge that he was a friend of sinners, was that also baseless? Or did they have some ground to call the Lord Jesus Christ the friend of sinners? And what does that actually mean? So we're going to divide up our time this morning like this. First of all, we're going to see what friend and sinners actually mean. Then we're going to see those to whom God offer, uh, Jesus offered friendship in the Scriptures. Then we're going to ask, well, what was Jesus like as a friend to those with whom he, or to whom he offered his friendship? And uh, then we'll draw some applications out from what we have seen. First then, what do friend and sinners mean? Let's start with friend. Uh, it can mean a lot of things. We're going to look at a few of those a little bit later on. Uh, but here are some definitions. The first from Merriam-Webster. Um, a friend is one who is attached to another by affection or esteem. And here's another one from uh, a, a Greek lexicon. If you look up that word, friend of sinners, in, in Matthew 11 there, um, it will tie it back to this understanding of the word. It's a person with whom one associates and for whom there is affection or personal regard. So both of those definitions, I hope you can see, have this idea of affection and of attachment or association um, at their heart. Let's turn now then to the word sinners. Um, hopefully we have a pretty good idea what this means. Uh, but it means those who are sinful, those who live immoral lives, those who are corrupt, those who are unclean. Literally, if you look into the word, it has the meaning of someone who's missed the mark. 
And that's certainly true because the mark here is perfect keeping of the law of God. And a sinner is someone who has never done that. They have missed the mark. For the Pharisees, it meant just about everybody who was not a Pharisee. The Gentiles. Uh, I suspect they would certainly have used it of Samaritans. Anyone who didn't match up to their standards. And certainly in the time of Jesus, it was a word that was often used for women of ill repute. Ladies of the night, you might say. So, to be a friend of sinners, you'd have to be somebody who showed affection and attachment to people like that. The refuse, the dregs of society, and you would have to associate with them. That's what somebody would have to be like if they earned and merited the title friend of sinners. So, let's see, secondly then, to whom Jesus does offer friendship. What do the scriptures have to tell us about the kind of people that Jesus shows attachment for and with whom he associates himself? First, he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 5, uh, let's just read verses 27 to 32. After that, Jesus went out and noticed a tax collector named Levi, later named Matthew, sitting in the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he left everything behind and got up and began to follow him. And Levi gave a big reception for him in his house. And there was a great crowd of tax collectors and other people who were reclining at the table with them. The Pharisees and their scribes began grumbling at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with the tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered and said to them, it is not those who are well who need a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And then in Luke 15, the verse from our meditation this morning. Now all the tax collectors and the sinners were coming near him to listen to him. Both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. Now, uh, so that we don't make any mistakes here, let's think about tax collectors for a while. Uh, this does not mean your friendly IRS employees who every year take from you what the federal government has determined you ought to pay. Um, with which we agree or disagree to varying extents. Uh, but at least um, what they are doing, uh, I suspect, they are doing uh, honestly and uh, not doing it with any malpractice. Uh, not so the tax collectors at the time of Jesus. These were people to whom the uh, authority to take up taxes was basically farmed out uh, there was a very organized system, it's like a pyramid scheme, if you like. Um, come and be a tax collector, and uh, if you take enough taxes, you can cream some off the top. Um, this was a very corrupt and perverse group of people. They indulged in blackmail, because having got the stamp of authority from Rome to collect taxes, uh, they thought, well, this is rather good, this is uh, too good an opportunity to pass up. Uh, so there would be blackmail, there would be extortion. They certainly didn't feel the need to confine themselves and collect only the taxes required by the Roman Empire. They went beyond that. They abused 
their power. So if you wanted a, a contemporary uh, comparison to the tax collectors in those days, it's not quite the same activity, but think of loan sharks, okay? Once you start to owe them money, you never get out from under them. They're always coming with more requests and uh, they associate and, and, and conduct themselves uh, in a very um, corrupt and sinful, wicked manner. But there was more than that because here they are as Jews, many of them, Matthew, Levi certainly was, and who were they actually working for? They're working for the occupying forces. In other words, they were traitors. They were committing treason against the nation of Israel. And the Pharisees wanted nothing to do with such people, to do with those who were so wicked and uh, abusing the power that they'd been given. And that power came to them from an occupying force. They were traitors, they were crooks, they were sharks, they were absolutely reprehensible people. And here is Jesus, sitting down more than once and eating and drinking in their company. Reaching out to them, receiving them. Maybe you can start to see what was getting the Pharisees so aerated about the Lord Jesus Christ and his behavior. So he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners. Is there more? Oh yes, oh, there's more. He lets prostitutes touch him. Look at Luke chapter 7. And we'll read verses 37 to 39. Remember I said this word sinner was often used of women of ill repute? There was a woman in the city who was a sinner. And when she learned that Jesus was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and kept wiping them with the hair of her head and kissing his feet and anointing them with the perfume. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of person this woman is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. You can probably imagine, I'm not going to go into great details to elaborate on what kind of life this woman had lived and was clearly had a reputation for having lived. An immoral life of promiscuity, possibly adultery, fornication, probably a life in which there was a great liability to contract all kinds of diseases, and uh, such women were despised and detested by the Pharisees. They were unclean, and they wouldn't ever let a woman like this touch them. And here is Jesus reclining at the table in this Pharisee's home and receiving this woman and her touching and her tears and her worship, her gratitude. And he was not uncomfortable in that situation. He received a sinner. 
Well, then, also, there are many other examples. Let's take one more. He has dealings with the Samaritans. John's Gospel, chapter 4, verses 7 through 9. You'll know this account. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink, since I am a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Now the Samaritans were those who were put into the land when, when Israel was out on exile. They were put into the land to manage it. And pretty soon they discovered that the God of that land had certain requirements for how its inhabitants should live. And so whilst they didn't give up their own gods, they did send and have somebody who could come and instruct them of how the God of that land needed to be worshipped. And so Samaritan worship was born, and it focused in this town, um, which was Shechem in the Old Testament, called Sychar uh, here in the New Testament. And these people were despised by the Jews. Um, that's a message that seems to come through of many people, doesn't it, this morning? They were not permitted when, when the Jews returned and were unable to rebuild the temple. They were kept out. That wasn't necessarily a wrong thing to do, but they were excluded from that activity. They had no part with Israel in it, uh, certainly at that point in time. The Jews hated them, despised them. They'd rather walk all the way around Samaria to get somewhere else than actually go through uh, the middle of it. You imagine the, the sharp intake of breath when Jesus tells the story of the good Samaritan. There's an oxymoron. The only good Samaritan is a dead one, you could almost imagine the Jews saying. And he shows how careless the Levites and others amongst the Jews were of the plight of this man who'd been robbed. And along comes the last person in the world that you would ever expect to do anything for somebody like that. And he does it. Who was the neighbor? I suppose him that had mercy on him will go and do the same thing. And here is Jesus now in that town of Sychar that was Shechem. He's gone through Samaria. He's actually talking to a Samaritan. And it's a woman. And he's sitting down with her. They're on their own at Jacob's well, and he's asking her to give him a drink. And she's astonished. What are you doing? You're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan. And I'm a woman. Why are you having any dealings with me? Jews don't do that kind of thing. So why are you doing it? This wasn't the only time either. Uh, if you look through the gospel accounts, you'll find that Jesus deliberately went through Samaria on several occasions, and that in fact, many of them came to know him. It's interesting, isn't it? how the Pharisees would have no dealings with people like the Samaritans, the prostitutes, the tax collectors, and all the other sinners who met with condemnation from their lips. But here is Jesus who will have nothing to do with them. I didn't come to call the righteous, if that's what you think you are. I didn't come for you. I came for those who know they're sick and who know they need help. Those are the ones that I have come to befriend. So there's the evidence of Scripture. Were the Pharisees justified to give Jesus this title, friend 
of sinners. Clearly, they were. And clearly, if you look at the accounts and the things that Jesus said, he preferred to be amongst them where he could minister grace and salvation rather than amongst those who thought they were so good that they would never have need of someone to save them because they could do it all for themselves. Thank you very much. Jesus hasn't changed, you see. That's the thing. He's the same yesterday and today and forever. So if he was the friend of sinners then, I can guarantee, and many of us here know from personal experience, he is the friend of sinners now. He still receives sinners. And we praise him for that. But if that's true, if he is the friend of sinners, what kind of friend can we expect him to be? I said earlier on that the word friend has many shades of meaning. Well, here's a few um, that it has. And we'll see, firstly, the kind of friend that Jesus is not. And then we'll look at the kind of friend that Jesus is. The first is, he's not a Facebook friend. Okay? You know what I mean by that. We have these new verbs in our language thanks to Facebook. I'm not sure that's a good thing, but it's true. I can now friend you. Um, if you're Anglo-Saxon, the, the thought of doing something like that to the English language is almost more than you can bear. Uh, but it's only worse if I can also unfriend you. Okay? But what do I have to do? Am I saying that I want to associate with you and that I regard you with affection and I have attachment for you, therefore I'm going to make you my friend on Facebook? No, it actually means you take your mouse and you go click. And that's it. Suddenly uh, you're a friend. Or you think, I've had enough of this, don't want to see any more of this person's posts, and so you go click, and now you're not a friend anymore. That's not the kind of friend Jesus is. So let's not get Facebook and the truth of the gospel confused. Jesus is not a fair weather friend. Okay, you know what that is. Um, sadly, his disciples behaved a little bit like that on the night he was arrested. Uh, he was taken into custody and they ran away. They were fair weather friends to some extent. We know the trauma and the, uh, the heartache they were going through. I'm not sure you and I would have done any better than they did. But nevertheless, when the going got tough, they ran for it. Now, these ideas of Facebook friend and fair weather friend uh, suggest that friends are things that can come and go. We're going to look at another thing later on, the best friend forever. Um, going to have a word for some of the girls in the congregation because I think that's a, that's a thing that girls indulge in from what I can gather. Um, best friends forever is not true, by the way. Um, and if I ask for a show of hands how many people have had best friends forever who now don't have the same best friend forever, we might find out that the forever bit is entirely questionable. And if you're a Christian, what are you doing having a better friend than Jesus? But let's leave that on one side. All these things show and, and, and indicate that friends can come and go. But Jesus isn't like that. Plutarch, who, who lived long enough ago um, not to have been subject to Facebook, at least, said this. Um, I don't need a friend who changes when I change and who nods when I nod. My shadow does that much better. Okay? We don't need a friend who changes, comes and goes, blows hot and cold, and so on and so forth. So Jesus isn't like that. Well, what kind of friend is he then? He's a friend to those who are in need. We sang that in one of our hymns. A friend in need is a friend indeed. And that's the kind of friend 
Jesus is when he came alongside the prostitutes and the tax collectors and the loan sharks and the Samaritans, the scum and the refuse of that society. They needed a friend like him. They were in a dire situation. They were cut off from God by those who held the keys of the kingdom at that time, shut out from worship, pronounced to be unclean, unwelcome, and basically unloved. And here comes Jesus, and he shows love for them. And he receives them into his presence. And he uh, saves many of them out of that dire situation that they had got themselves into because of their sin. Now, our need of a friend like Jesus is exactly the same as theirs because our sins have separated us from God. They've made us liable to condemnation. They have put us in a situation where something needs to be done for us if we are going to live. And that's something that we can't do for ourselves. We are unlovely. We are helpless. We are powerless. And Jesus offers himself as the friend in our need, able to save those who are sinners. He's a friend indeed. He's a loyal friend. He's not like these Facebook friends. You don't even know if you've been unfriended by them. They can do a runner uh, and you never know about it. Um, or fair weather friends, you probably do know when they desert you and leave you hanging out to dry. And it's not very nice. Well, Jesus isn't like that. Notice that in terms of his reputation, he lost it as far as the Pharisees were concerned. Um, whatever good reputation he might have hoped for, the authorities basically came to regard him as a sinner himself. If you look at John 9, 24, I hadn't really thought about this until I prepared this sermon. He's, he's just healed this man born blind, and, and instead of actually rejoicing at the power of God and the glorious thing that has been done, the Pharisees are picking over it and sort of saying, well, we're not sure this is such a great thing. And they interview the parents, and they interview the blind man to try and get to the bottom of it and find some charge they can bring against Jesus. So a second time they called the man who has been blind, who had been blind from birth, and said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. And the man says, well, I don't know whether he's a sinner or not. But what I do know is this. I was blind, and now I see. So put that in your pipe and smoke it, Pharisees. And this Jesus was so frequently among these outcasts and these dregs of society. I think that's how he got this name. Him? He's a friend of sinners. The only time you see him is when he's in their home, eating and drinking and allowing prostitutes to touch him. The Messiah? I don't think so. He's not going to lead us out from under the oppression of Rome. Do you think Jesus cared what the Pharisees thought, that he'd lost his reputation with these self-righteous hypocrites? Do you think it concerned him in the slightest degree? Or do you think he rejoiced when he saw the broken heart of someone who was lost in the life of a prostitute, now healed and restored and forgiven and made a child of God? I know what I think. He's a loyal friend. Proverbs 18.24, he is uh, a friend who sticks closer than a brother. If you come to Jesus and he becomes your friend, he will stay with you through thick and thin, and he will save you 
to the uttermost. He is a loving friend. How do we know that? John 15, verse 13 through 17. Well, we'll just read uh, the, the, the bit of, of note of importance here. Greater love has no one than this, said Jesus, that one lay down his life for his friends. You see, he did more than just identify with these sinners and be seen in their company and give up any good reputation he might have had by being with them. He went further than that and he paid the only price that would set them free. He gave up his life. He shed his blood for them. He's a friend who loves enough to die for his helpless friends. What I've already said about the best friend forever, he's not a best friend forever. He is the best friend you could ever have. And if you have him, he is your friend forever. Not like the BFFs that uh, I see on bits of jewelry and plastered across mugs and uh, Facebook posts and, and all over the place. You're my BFF until next week when I'll unfriend you on Facebook and find somebody else to take your place forever. Jesus is the best. It's true, isn't it? Jesus is, however, the best friend you could ever have. And when you have him, he is your friend forever. Romans 8:38. I'm convinced, says Paul, that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor any other created thing. What has he left out? Any other created thing. None of these will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord the best friend you could have, the best friend forever. And here's the remarkable thing, that this friend is still the friend of sinners. And he still offers himself to be friends with all who will come to him. We read it earlier on in Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28. Come to me, all. That's absolutely comprehensive. You cannot look at that word this morning, and I would invite you to look at it now. Come to me, all. It's not leaving anyone out. If you're weary and burdened by your sin, if you feel like the scum and refuse, spiritually speaking, that actually you are, and we all are as we're born into this world, this is for you. All who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. He is the friend of sinners. He loves the unlovely. He died to save them eternally and he will never let them go. And you don't have to clean yourself up before you come. I hope you can understand that from the message this morning. You couldn't do it anyway. But it doesn't matter because he's the one who touches the untouchables. He's the one who reaches out and receives the sinners and goes into the heart of a country like Samaria in order to have a meeting with a woman at a well so that he might bring salvation to her soul. You don't have to clean yourself up for this friend of sinners. You can come as you are because in actual fact, there's no other way that you can come. Well, let's have a couple of points of application 
and then, then we are done. I hope you can see that Jesus quite clearly deserves this title, Friend of Sinners, but it's not a contemptible term. For us who know him, we rejoice because he's become our friend and we needed him because we were scum. We were worms. You can't imagine how revolted God was when he looked upon us outside of Christ. But he's done something. He sent the friend of sinners to clean us up and he received us to himself. So here's a couple of applications for we who know this friend of sinners this morning. The first, this is your friend. I said it earlier on, if it wasn't actually written here, could you believe it? Could you believe that God would leave heaven and come into this cesspit and would actually reach down, would descend into hell and receive the punishment for guilty, daring worms so that he could rescue them and take them up into glory with him? Would you believe it? But it's true. And if you know the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, he's your friend. How grateful we should be. That's the first application. But here's the second one. I said earlier on that the titles of Jesus help us to become imitators of him. Would we be called friend of sinners? Would the people in the world who think they are so good and so righteous look at us and say, him or her? <sighs> Friends of sinners. Look at the company they keep. Look at the scum they associate with. Look at the ones they're attached to. How do we regard the traitors, the swindlers, the blackmailers, the corrupt? Just think of a few names from recent and, and, and less recent history. Julian Assange, the founder of WikiLeaks, who many would argue by his actions led to not a few people losing their lives in the armed forces. Many people regard that as a traitorous act. What do we think of him? Are we con do we hold him in contempt? Or do we have a heart of compassion? Think of Al Capone. Think of Osama bin Laden. The only difference between them and you and me is that God didn't hold back the sin that was in their hearts the way he may have held it back for us. So we couldn't express all of that corruption that is certainly there. Do we have a heart of compassion for politicians? We know that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And we see plenty of that kind of corruption in our politicians. And it's distressing. But do we have a heart of compassion for these people? Or do we despise them? Do we hold them in utter contempt? Do we mock them and ridicule them? Would we not be seen dead in the same room with them? Do we long for them to be saved? To come to know the friend of sinners? What about adulterers? What about prostitutes? What about, dare I say it, homosexuals? Are those the untouchables for us, the people that we wouldn't want to be seen dead with? Or do we have a heart like our Savior, who doesn't condone the sin, not for an instant, but he reaches out and he receives the sinner and he preaches the gospel to them so that they might be saved? Where are we at in our Christian lives? Are we more like the Pharisees? Or more like Jesus, the friend of sinners, whoever they are, whatever 
sin they may be caught and trapped in. Do we have a heart of compassion for them? And do we believe the gospel could save even them? It can. And then a word for those who do not know Jesus here this morning. And there are several, I know. Um, you are a sinner. Um, that is certain. You know it. I don't need to persuade you about that. But have you met the friend of sinners? Do you realize how much you need him? You see, he wasn't a friend to the Pharisees who saw no need for Jesus at all. He wasn't a friend for those who wanted to continue in their sin and basically turned their backs on Jesus and suppressed all of his teaching and all of his claims upon them and said, no, this is the way I want to live. I want my sin. He wasn't their friend. He was concerned for them. He wept over them and the hardness of their hearts. But they wanted nothing to do with him, and if they would not repent, he would not help. He's a friend to those who feel how defiled and unworthy of God they are, who recognize how instant to instant they break another command, they think another thought, they do another deed, and it's all sin. It's just a mountain of sin. And all the best things that they think they've ever done, they suddenly realize, like the Apostle Paul did, it's just one enormous heap of dung. Just a stench to God. And they become dissatisfied with that. And they start to fear what living a life like that will mean when the life comes to an end. And then they see Jesus. Does the hymn writer say, two arms outstretched to save. And they hear him say, come to me, and I will give you rest. And he means it. You know, you could have hundreds of Facebook friends. Some of you probably do. You can have lots of fair weather friends, and you'll find out about them sooner than you would probably want to. You may have dozens of best friends forever. You may even have good, close, personal friends here on earth. But how many of them will give up their life to save you when you are in that point of need? How many of them would go to hell in your place if by doing so, you would not have to go there. There is a friend who is like that, who will do that for you. And it's Jesus, if you will come to him. His friendship is more precious than words can begin to describe, and he is ready this instant to be your friend if you will reach out to him. He will receive you. Look at the people he received in Scripture. Do you think he won't receive you? So leave your sin and come to the friend of sinners and come now. Let's spend a few moments in quietness and reflect on these words and ask the Lord to bless them to us in his name.